Hello, everyone. My name is Courtney Brown, and I'm a marketing manager here at Enterprise DB. I'll be your host today for our webinar, Exploring Postgres with Bruce Momjen. I'm joined by Bruce EDB, Senior Database Architect, as well as co-founder and core team member of PostgreSQL Global Development Group. Before we get started, I just want to go through a few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded. We'll be sharing the recording along with the slides after the broadcast. All lines are currently muted. If you have a question, please feel free to submit it in the question panel. Today's session is scheduled for about 45 minutes, and we will allow some time for Q&A. If we do not have time to address all questions, we'll follow up afterwards with any attendees whose questions were not answered. And now, without further ado, here's Bruce. Well, hello, everybody. Great to have you here. Um, I'm calling you today or talking to you today from snowy Philadelphia. It is snowing, so uh, kind of an exciting uh, day for us. Uh, yeah, it snows quite a bit in February, but uh, um, it's just coming down. I'm looking out the window there. Um, wonderful to be with you today. Uh, I enjoy these webinars and obviously having a chance to sort of talk about something I've been involved with for 22, uh, 23 years almost now. Uh, and that is Postgres. Uh, this is an interesting topic. I think you're going to find it interesting as well. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to presenting it to you. The format basically will be about a half hour of, of a lecture. <clears throat> and then um, we have two polls we're going to do with you. Uh, and then we're going to have some Q&A. So again, uh, that's kind of how we're going to plan the 45 minutes out. Again, if you have to leave early, uh, we understand. For those of you who aren't familiar with Postgres, it is an uh, object relational database uh, started as a community project in 1996, which is actually the year that I had started. Very similar to other um, uh, enterprise uh, relational databases, very extendable. That's actually one of the reasons it was developed at uh, University of California at Berkeley uh, in the mid 80s. Uh, and it's supported on pretty much every major operating system and cloud provider. Uh, pre-installed in most cases. Uh, the website for Postgres is uh, listed right there. There's a core team of five. I happen to be one of them. Uh, but we have a, a development community of hundreds who work every year to uh, put out a, a very extensive release uh, that I think is very impressive. We have a very good reputation for that. And of course, we have not only volunteers involved, but also uh, a number of companies who have uh, volunteered their employees to help us. And, I being one from Enterprise DB, um, that URL there at the bottom. If you'd like to get more involved with the community, that's where you would go. Enterprise DB, I've been with them since 2006. It's a long time. Uh, we have uh, over 4,000 uh, customers. Uh, we've got very steady growth. Uh, there's basically, uh, we support community Postgres, and we also support uh, a proprietary version uh, called Postgres uh, Advanced Server, uh, or EPAS, e, uh, ADB Postgres Advanced Server. And uh, that has Oracle compatibility, some performance things, uh, management things, and so forth. Uh, but in addition, uh, the database is not the only thing you're going to need. And we're going to talk about that, actually, in the, in the seminar today. Uh, tooling. Uh, you often need tooling to use a database efficiently uh, in an enterprise, and Enterprise DB has a number of tooling options there. Uh, we'll be talking about that. Uh, certainly professional services and support are important. Um, and uh, uh, not only do we uh, offer those to customers, but we're also very involved in the Postgres community. Uh, this is a slide just kind of explaining uh, the top, talking about um, effectively the things that we do um, in terms of community Postgres and then, you know, the, the stuff we do at the bottom with uh, with advanced server and so forth. Uh, Enterprise DB is uh, on, the, uh, on the Gartner Magic Quadrant. Uh, I'm trying to remember where it, it, it moves around a little bit, but, uh, uh, oh, I'm embarrassed. Here it is right here. Um, so, uh, again, uh, we've got uh, a very nice steady growth there. So, uh, let's get started. Um, this is the outline of what we're going to talk about. Um, again, I am kind of excited about it, particularly uh, number six. Uh, this is always kind of an odd question. Uh, do you need a vendor? Which seems like a really crazy, crazy question, but um, I think that's going to be sort of a, a good summarization of, of kind of how how the community and how Postgres and how open source is dramatically different than the traditional 
uh, commercial uh, proprietary vendor relationship. Uh, the goal of this seminar is really to explain that if you're used to dealing with <clears throat> Oracle and Microsoft and IBM for years and years and years, uh, this is a different world. And um, it's a good world in a lot of ways, but it's also a different world, and you have to adjust to that. And one of the goals here is that we I explain to you exactly how it's going to be different because having talked to a number of enterprise DB customers over the years, I do get these kind of questions. Well, what, like they're confused because previously uh, when they were dealing with a proprietary vendor, they had so few options that they didn't really have to make a decision. They just picked a vendor and the vendor did everything and did everything in a in an expensive way, in an inflexible way, but they did everything. And what you have with open source is is choice. And I think that is sort of the defining thing I'm going to be talking about. We're going to talk about the database server. There is some choice there. We're going to talk about extensions. I've talked about that already. There, I'll explain what they are and why they're useful in Postgres much more than other databases. We'll talk about deployment utilities, which again, there's a huge variety that normally you wouldn't think there is. Um, then we'll talk about monitoring options, um, and finally uh, talk about a vendor. So um, open source, many, many, many options. Um, this is the traditional proprietary closed source customer. So this is Oracle or DB2 or Microsoft SQL. It's a black box. You can't see the source code. The only people who can see the source code in those particular uh, products are the employees of the company who your who your who the vendor is right so it's incredibly hard for another company for example to support oracle oracle can support oracle because they can see the source code but other companies have tremendous difficulty doing support for oracle because they often have to guess exactly what's in that black box and how it behaves and where the bugs are um it's a very in a, almost impossible very very inefficient process to try and have another vendor get involved if they can't see inside that source code, if they can't see inside that black box. And therefore they have to go, if you're using that software, you almost by definition have to get support and to some extent tooling from the person who can see inside the black box. So you really don't have a lot of choice. With open source, because the source code is open, there are a number of companies that get, get involved. Um, there's a lot more variety. There's a lot more choice available. And um, this is sort of the new world where you have a very dynamic environment, you have many, many choices, and now as a person who has to decide on some software, you've now got a whole bunch of choices of not only which software am I gonna use, but which which vendor am I gonna use? There may, there's more than one in almost every case, okay? Which tooling am I gonna use? Which support company, which training company, which whatever, okay, um, which monitoring tools, um, which extensions, all these things now are, are, are a choice for you. And that's, I think, really the big change that uh, people have going from a closed source op uh, database to an open source database. For example, now that you, with it, this, the, the box is open, you can get support by looking at the source code yourself. If that's something you're inclined to do, People do it every day. That's one of the reasons Postgres has become so popular. And one of the reasons we have such a vibrant uh, development community because we have people working every day, looking at that source code, looking to improve Postgres, looking to solve six fix bugs. You can go to a support provider like Enterprise DB or one of the other vendors, which are available to give you support. As, so you don't have to go grubbing around the source code so you can efficiently use the database. Um, because you have somebody else who's doing a lot of the heavy work for you. And also the mailing lists at the bottom, the Postgres mailing lists are very involved. So people often will go to the Postgres email list and say, hey, I'm trying to do this query or I'm doing this thing. I'm getting this weird result. What does that mean? Uh, I deal with that every day. Hundreds, thousands of people deal with that every day. Um, so again, a great example of choice that's available in open source that's not available when that box is closed that when only the vet, one single vendor can look in that box. So um, <clears throat> that was the sort of big picture I wanted to give you, the idea that in open source you have a lot of options. Um, 
Uh, now I'm going to go into detail and I'm going to look at the various options that are available for monitoring, available for the database server, available for uh, extensions, and, and so forth. So um, the, the probably the most common uh, deployment of Postgres is the one here at the top. Um, the one, the, the version you download from uh, www.postgresql.org, which is effectively the database server that is distributed by the community. Um, again, that's distributed every year. Uh, there's a major release every year, and then every quarter uh, there's a minor release. So you're getting a minor release every three months, I guess. Um, and those have bug fixes and 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 so forth. Okay. Uh, there are a number of closed source versions of the database server. Uh, the database server that's distributed by the community is BSD licensed, which means that companies are able, unlike GPL in some ways, the companies are able to take that source code, close it, improve it, and then sell it as an enhanced product. And as you can see, there are five companies, Enterprise DB being one of them, that actually distribute closed source versions of Postgres. Um, now, they're, op they're closed to different levels. Um, but in general, uh, these are uh, compiled programs that are sell sold to customers uh, where the source code is generally not available. And um, that's just a different kind of approach to distributing software. Uh, in a way, it takes the dynamics of the community um, and then layers on top of it additional things. Um, they may be additional things that customers need that the community isn't interested in or the community hasn't got to yet. It could be, um, you know, enhancements that work for special tooling or so forth. There's a whole bunch of reasons that people might create closed source versions. What's interesting, it's kind of a hybrid approach because the, the, the major developments happen in the community and then you're just layering on top of it. And again, a lot of companies we have, that we're now doing that. Um, if you're curious what uh, particular products have been derived from that, the URL there at the bottom is a huge, <laughs> chart of all of the companies that are now a list of all the all the derivatives of Postgres uh, because it's open source uh, this database has tended to generate a huge amount of derived databases um, because it's very good source code uh, very reliable <clears throat> and therefore a logical place to start if you want to build something custom either for yourself or to create a custom product having talked about the database let's talk about extensions now um, as I mentioned in the intro uh, I got involved with Postgres with 19, in 1996, but effectively Postgres started in 1986 at the University of California, Berkeley. And the reason it was created was as an extendable database, as a database that could be added to. Um, it can be added to, you can add functions, you can add server-side languages, you can add um, operators and data types and Casts and indexing methods, a whole bunch of stuff that you can effectively add to Postgres because it was designed to be added to from the beginning, not like a bolt-on that some of the vendors do. This database was designed to be added to. So therefore, these extensions, instead of being sort of a kludges that you want to stay away from, I remember when I used to use other databases, those extensions were usually a huge headache. Uh, not so in Postgres. Um, Postgres ships with a number of standard extensions, PG Crypto, uh, Postgres Foreign Data Wrapper for um, for SQL Med sort of interfaces. Uh, we have a repository, PGXN, um, and then we have some really cool extensions like PostGIS, which does um, which does uh, uh, geospatial, uh, if you're interested. And then there's also Citus, uh, which is an extension that does data warehouse. So again, a whole bunch of different extensions um, that can be added to Postgres. Again, this as a person who's coming into the open source and into the Postgres ecosystem, you now <clears throat> should sign it, kind of decide which, you know, which extensions do I want? Um, a lot of vendors, when they add extensions for, to proprietary things, the extension doesn't work all the time. It doesn't work well with other tools. It doesn't back up right or doesn't restore all these weird things. That's not really true of Postgres. It's a pretty, it's a pretty solid ecosystem. Um, so I wouldn't dismiss it. it. There's actually some really useful stuff here. Okay. Um, I mentioned server-side languages. Here's all the server-side languages you can add to Postgres. And you'll notice some of them at the top, they come pre-installed with Postgres. <clears throat> some of them are available on GitHub, some on PGXN, 
and some of external. So they had a great sort of display of exactly what's available and where it's available. In fact, not all of them are shipped with Postgres. Some of them you have to go other places to find. Um, and, and the reason they're kind of extensions is because they're not generally useful. They may be incredibly useful in your particular problem domain, but they may not be useful to other people, and that's why they're extensions. Deployment utilities. This is another area where you normally have to make a decision. Um, normally, you're going to be uh, choosing uh, utilities that come from the single closed source vendor, because that's the vendor, only vendor who knows the source code, the only vendor who can create a backup tool that works, and so forth. Um, what's really interesting about Postgres is because it's open source, you have a whole bunch of different options. So you have deployment of utilities uh, that come with Postgres. Uh, uh, I have an example listed there. PGXN has a bunch of tool repositories, and we also have some company-produced ones if you go to that URL there. So, for example, for backup, <clears throat> you would think there's only going to be one way to backup Postgres. No. <laughs> um, the backup process, and, and in terms of not only backing it up, but integrating that backup process into your enterprise, into an enterprise environment, enterprise tooling, um, backup windows and recovery and, and, and uh, what is it, ret retention policies and all that stuff that goes around backup that isn't really part of the backup. It's about managing the backup. And that's effectively what these tools do. Um, the ones shipped with Postgres pretty much just do the job, the, the, the standard backup job, PG dump, PG restore, point in time recovery, again, uh, all supported as backup options with Postgres. But PG backrest. Uh, an external tool uh, developed um, by a group of, of people who are associated with Postgres, but not really part of the community um, in the sense that they have a separate release cycle, they have a separate download site. Um, this is another backup tool which allows you to do backups and manage those backups. Barman, another one. Um, backrest, a lot of the people are in the U.S. Barman, some of them are in Europe. So again, they're all over the world uh, doing this. One of, the, one of the great backup tools is BART uh, by Enterprise DB, which again is a third option to do backup, uh, which gives you all of these way, different ways of doing backups, all these different ways of maintaining them and restoring them. It does have some features that the other ones don't have, and the other ones might have some features that BART doesn't have. So again, you have to look at what features you want. Do you want incremental backup? Uh, do you want parallel backup? Uh, you know, how... Do you want your retention policy to be defined? What tooling do you want it to integrate with it? And then you have to pick your tooling. So again, you would think it would be a straightforward thing, but no, now you have to make a decision. The good news is that is that these are freely, these are, well, BARD is part of the Enterprise DB uh, package. Uh, the other ones um, are freely available. So again, you can try them out um, and see which ones kind of you like the best. Uh, failover utilities. Again, you'd think there'd be one failover utility. No. Um, there is Petroni, uh, which is uh, primarily developed by Zalando in uh, Berlin, uh, but has a, a fairly wide following in terms of uh, failover, although it's a fairly complicated tool. It's, I think it's built around Zookeeper, so it's got like a whole bunch of dependencies, and it's a big, big package, right? Uh, Rep Manager, another tool. This one primarily developed by Second Quadrant. Um, it's a C program, much more bare bones. Uh, much more just about sort of failover in a simple, you know, in a more straightforward case. And finally, EFM, again, part of the Enterprise DB package, uh, which does automatic failover and integrates with all the other tooling and stuff that Enterprise DB produces. Again, you have to sort of decide, well, which one do I want to use? Uh, I, you know, ideally, you just kind of try them and then see which one sort of fits your uh, your needs. Or you write your own, which you can also do. Although I don't recommend it for failover because it's really hard to test failover. Um, cloud deployments, another one where we're kind of a lot got a lot of options. Um, Postgres is available on AWS and Azure. Um, it has uh, there are multi-cloud, um, multi-vendor clouds. EDB Arc is a great tool for deploying Postgres in the cloud, um, including multi-cloud uh, architectures. And again, it integrates with all the enterprise DB tooling. Uh, you can do Docker deployments. You can use Kubernetes uh, to do deployments. Again, lots and lots of options for uh, such deployments. Monitoring. 
um, again, you've, you're probably now uh, getting to understanding the flow of the story here, right? Um, there are a number of monitoring tools that ship with Postgres. Uh, PG Stat Activity, PG Locks, the Statistics Views, views PG Stat Statements, uh, all are very, very capable, but also very bare bones monitoring tools for Postgres. Uh, there are a lot of independent tools available. Uh, PG Badger, uh, which is a tool that scrapes your server logs and then shows you all of your common queries and how long they took and total execution time for all those queries. Uh, and of course, there are more heavyweight monitoring tools like Nagios, Prometheus, uh, Grafana, which are, um, which are plug into Postgres and again, give you a level of monitoring as well. Uh, Postgres Enterprise Manager, I think sort of the king of monitoring in my mind, uh, because it just does so much. Uh, again, designed exclusively for, for, for Postgres, um, built on top of PG Admin sort of as a base, it does a whole bunch of stuff. If you have to monitor, you know, tens or hundreds of servers, uh, Postgres Enterprise Manager is really like a go-to tool for that. Um, again, provided by Enterprise DB, uh, I think it's a, a kind of a great option. But again, you have all these options available. Um, you're going to need to decide uh, which tools really fit what you're doing. This is a kind of interesting slide. You're going to get to see it later. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but um, effectively, when you're thinking about monitoring, um, you have to think about sort of two domains of monitoring. Um, the the left domain is the reporting domain. This is the this is the domain that just reports what happens continually. Okay. And the right domain is the sort of alerting and aggregation domain. This is the domain that's going to alert you when something happens unusually or is going to give you some kind of report which summarizes what happens. Okay. So my point is that when you're thinking about monitoring and you're trying to pick the tools from the previous slide, figure out how, what your needs are. Do you need just reporting or do you need reporting and alerting or reporting or lead alerting and aggregation? And then if you're going to do all of these, are you are you going to be able to put all these tools together? That's really kind of the question, I think, that of, of sort of having a monitoring tool that fits all your needs. Um, and as you can see from all of the little text here, every little need has a different place to go. Um, Postgres Enterprise Manager does somewhat a good job of sort of bringing this together, but a lot of the older, other tools just, just address a specific one of these needs. And that's great, but again, just be aware you've got a whole bunch of options now. Uh, and they're very high quality tools, so that's, that's actually good. So um, sort of to kind of bring it together and sort of ask the question that I think is really, really odd, uh, but also is really, I think, valuable to ask, is having gone through, okay, now I'm using an open source database. Now I have an open box. I have a clear box. I have a choice of vendors. I have a choice of tooling. I have a choice of monitoring. Um, I have a choice of failover, right? Um, what do I do? How do I think of my vendor? Because in the old days, you had to think of your vendor as the single source of everything related to that database, right? I mean, you you picked a vendor and that was going to be your go-to for everything. That's really not true anymore with open source. So um, with open source, the database server, there are multiple versions of that if you want. And then there are many extensions and tools available and many of them are available for free, okay? Um, if you need something and you can't, ha you can't, and, and you can't find a free version, do you write it yourself, right? Is it, it's a simple matter of programming. I'm, that's kind of in quotes because a simple matter of programming can be a huge overhead for your organization to create a special monitoring tool or sp create a special failover tool. Uh, but, but for your particular organization, that might make sense depending on the size of your organization, the, the amount of technical skill in your organization, um, and how much you really want to invest in creating your own custom solutions. This was really not true in the closed source world, but because that box is open, effectively you could almost do everything yourself. You could even create your own Postgres support team. I know that sounds way out in space, but there are some very large technology organizations that instead of aligning themselves with a particular company that provides Postgres support, they basically have done it 
themselves. So NTT in Japan is a great example. They've been with us for, oh boy, uh, must be 20, 18 years now. Um, tremendously supportive of the community. They have a team of 30 or 40 people uh, in Tokyo who support their ver their um, deployments of Postgres within the organization. Of course, NTT is a global, I think a global 30, number 35 or something. Uh, so they're, <laughs> They make Oracle look small, right? So again, for an organization that size to create their own team, it kind of made sense, I guess, for them. And they had needs at that time the community wasn't addressing that. Maybe not true anymore. But again, they started so long ago, they just ended went up going on their own. Um, so the point is that you actually can get by doing everything yourself. Um, uh, because the source is open. Um, it's just a simple matter of programming, although there can be a lot of dollar signs behind that. Um, everyone can become an expert, and that's maybe something you want to strive to um, as part of your involvement with Postgres. Uh, but being an expert has costs, and this is where I'm, I'm kind of going from the original behavior where you had to go to the vendor to get everything, right, to now I have a choice, right, and now I've got this sliding scale. How aligned, how much do I want to pay my vendor and how much do I want my vendor to do stuff for me and how much do I want to do stuff for myself? If you go to become an expert where you don't really leaning on a vendor at all, unfortunately, there are going to be costs associated with that. Payroll, management, testing, uh, risk, of course, is going to be an issue. Um, your deployments are going to take longer because you're going to have to write everything before you deploy it. You can't just pull it off the shelf and run it right away, which is what normally uh, uh, enterprises do that have a, a vendor who can supply all that tooling that's already written and ready to go. Um, you have an increasing dependency on your staff skills. So if staff leave or stiff staff, you know, you actually have to train your staff and keep your staff. Um, and if you decide to change directions, you have to now change your staff. Um, whereas most vendors will have tooling that will, for example, if you end up deploying on one cloud provider and you get your staff really knowledgeable about that, and then you go to another cloud provider, all of a sudden you've got to either get new staff who know the new cloud or uh, you go in-house and now you, they don't know cloud anymore. And it can get complicated. Uh, but it is the one advantage is easy to, to, custom, uh, to customize, but there is the, the, uh, the rigidity of that problem. Okay. And the way I'd like to explain it um, is uh, basically uh, cooking at home versus going to a restaurant. Now, as you all know, uh, you know, cooking at home has been been done for what thousands, millions of years. Um, restaurants have been around for a long time. And restaurants are doing fine. Even though people cook at home, they still go to restaurants. Why? Because when you cook at home, you have to get the ingredients. You have to cook. The, you have to cook. You have to have the skills to cook, which I personally don't have. <laughs> you have to. You probably can make only one or two dishes, um, and it's going to cost a lot more. It's going to cost less, but it's going to be more time. You go to a restaurant, you can have variety, they open the menu, you pick something. There's a whole staff back there who are experts at cooking. They have all of the ingredients. Um, everything's very simple. You're very flexible. Costs more money, usually, to eat at a restaurant, but it's less time. And that's exactly the kind of trade-off that you now have to think of for your vendors. Okay? Um, this is the best graphic I could come up with. Effectively, on the far left, this is you, do, you doing everything yourself. Okay? And what you're going to notice first off is that that bar is higher than all the other bars. And you might think, well, why would a bar, why would an option doing everything myself cost more? Well, it costs more because you're having to pay your staff to do everything related to that database. And you're having to pay them just to do it for you. If you're paying a vendor, that vendor is doing the same job, but they're doing it for thousands of customers. They can distribute those costs over all those customers. So you may be better with the second bar. Have your, have your vendor do a little bit, okay, and then you do some of it. The third bar actually ends up being the cheapest. You get a bigger amount the vendor does. You just do a little bit. And then the one on the far, like, far right is almost like you've outsourced the entire database to your vendor. And that can be very expensive. Uh, so, again, it's this sliding scale of trade-off now that you have that you didn't have before, right, um, that you now have to decide where do I want to go on this slide. So broad range of vendor cost options are available, more than the proprietary software. You have low cost vendors, you have high value vendors, high cost vendors. Um, you have to pick what type of vendor do I want? Do I want just somebody who's gonna answer the phone? They're not gonna provide any software. 
they don't they only have a small staff they don't do training um is that the vendor it's going to be a good fit for me or do i need a full service vendor um like a big hotel right that has uh you know has everything i'm going to need they're going to have i can pick up the phone and and ask the front desk i need something we're open 24 hours a day we have a full staff if you need something it'll be delivered to your room right that that's very efficient for an organization right so vendor expenses um are, so can somehow be less and give you increased efficiency and reduce your in-house costs so for example i pay my vendor 400,000 but I increased efficiency and reduced in-house costs by 700,000. That's a win, right? There's very many cases where that is true. Uh, more expensive vendors can sometimes increase efficiency and reduce costs more than inexpensive vendors. But again, you know your organization. You know you now have a choice in open source. This is the choice you have to make. Um, so, um, what are your vendor typically going to do? What types of things you're going to look for? Obviously. Um, there's going to be support. There's going to be consulting. Do they have open source products that you can use that are also supported? Do they have closed source products that you can use? Are they also supported? Um, do they do cloud hosting? Or do they support that? Do they do training? Do they help for the migration? Are they going to come in and check my systems? These are the types of things you need to look for in a vendor and figure out which vendor is going to be the best fit for you because you now have a choice. It's up to you to make that choice and choose the vendor that's going to basically make you the most efficient and save you the most amount of money. And the answer a lot of times isn't to do it yourself. The answer is to get a vendor who has a good alignment with your needs and your uh, cost structure. So um, that is all I wanted to cover. Um, if you're interested in uh, downloading Postgres, uh, the, URL, the URL there at the top uh, will do that for you. Uh, if you're interested in products and services related uh, from Enterprise DB, the second URL is, of course, the place to go. Uh, thank you very much. I am going to pass it back to Courtney, who I believe has a poll for us. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, before we go to Q&A, we're going to launch two quick polls um, that have to do with some of the discussion that Bruce went through. So here is the first one. Wow, that's really kind of interesting to see the, the votes. <laughs> okay, while the results are coming in, we'll ask um, one of the questions. Okay, so one question that came through is, what are the tools that we can use for development of Postgres functions and stored procedures? Currently, we use PG Admin. We're looking for a more rich tool similar to SQL Server Management Studio. Are there any good tools available in the market to buy that you recommend? Okay, so um, this is for, is this for, I'm sorry, were they asking for client side functions or server side functions? Do you know? For Uh -oh. I think they're looking for an alternative to PG admin. Okay, so actually, that's that's a good news. Um, there are a huge number, uh, thankfully, of uh, external tools which people. Um, in fact, I'm going to look real fast over here. Um, but there are a huge number of. Uh, third-party tools which which work with Postgres. So in the old days, Postgres was kind of kind of too small. Um, so uh, we, we everyone just kind of ignored Postgres. Um, but fortunately, now that we're so popular, everyone's kind of adding uh, uh, you know support for 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 Postgres. So. Um, let me just actually, should I just go to the website? I actually could do that. Let me do that. Um, I think the poll is up right now. Hold on. I will close the no, poll. That's fine. that's fine. So 
So you see where we are going. Here we go. Um, so uh, fortunately, the Postgres community has a <coughs> link, uh, which is very popular. And uh, this is a list of all of the tools um, that work. So um, I've heard good things about some of them. Uh, there's, oh boy, that's a lot. Gee, I don't remember. I didn't know there were that many. <laughs> um, uh, some of the close, DB Beaver I've heard good things about. Um, some of the closed source ones I've heard good things about. Let me see if I can find. Um, let me see here. Yeah, there's almost like too many, isn't it? Look at that. I mean, it's just uh, uh, DB Visualizer. A lot of people like that one. Um, and then also you can, you can um, what I often tell people to do is you just go to the, you guys go to the Postgres community and you go under uh, community and you go to mailing list and search. So I just do, and then you can, what's, what's kind of nice is you can, you can um, sort of look and see what DB forge. Um, so, you know, maybe you say um, recommend this is how I kind of do it. Um, and then you'll basically find a thread and they'll talk about the things they like about it or don't like about it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, maybe that's too many to, to list there. Uh, but yeah, that's I think that's the answer. Thanks, Bruce. Um, we're gonna run one more poll and then we'll take one more question before we wrap up. So. Watch this poll and then for our next question. Um, our next question is, is I do .NET development. Are there .NET Postgres drivers op that are open source? Are those packages headed by Enterprise DB? Okay, so um, no, there's, I mean, there's, there's uh, a free .NET driver. Uh, it is at, under active development. Um, you should have no trouble yeah, doing .NET, .NET tooling with, with Postgres. Okay, thank you, Bruce. I apologize, Those, um, that's all the time we have for questions today, but we will follow up to answer any questions that were unanswered. Thank you for joining us on the webinar. We'll be sharing this recording along with the slides as soon as possible. And this email will also include a survey link with questions similar to the ones that we just did in the poll to help gain insights about the tools and technologies this group is using. We can share these insights after the fact. They'll be in a summarized form and anonymous. I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Bye-bye.